Today we have a new translator. So later on you can compare who was better yesterday. But one thing is for sure that today's translator has a louder voice, even louder than my voice. So yesterday we had explained the ABC of spiritual knowledge, which is the understanding of the difference between the body and the soul. So when you obviously we cannot have a class of so-called spiritualists who do no work and just sit down and sleep and eat all day. Sometimes people misunderstand us and they say, you Hare Krishnas are simply a burden on society. You do no work, just sleep and eat. Especially in the Western society, there is so much emphasis upon working hard like a mura to earn money that if somebody is not working hard like the asses, they think that we are simply a burden on society. So you will be happy to hear that Krishna doesn't say that you should be idle and sit down or sleep all day. Krishna doesn't say, don't do your work, don't do your duty, just live as a live off the society. Krishna tells Arjuna, you cannot abstain from work. The point is, in this third chapter, Krishna explains the principle of karma yoga. So karma yoga means we work for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. There are different types of transcendentalists, such as those who understand, those who try to understand the Supreme Lord by the process of speculation and others by the process of devotional service. Arjuna is confused now. He does not know what he should do. He doesn't know whether he should engage in devotional service by working to fulfill Krishna's order to fight or he should just withdraw to the mountains. So Krishna says, Niyatam kuru karma tvam karma jayo ya karmana sharira yatra pechate ma prasidyat akarmaha. That, ho oh Arjuna, you must perform your prescribed duty. Krishna says, Arjuna, you cannot even maintain your own body if you do not work. That is a fact, isn't it? If you don't work and you don't earn or if you don't have some means of livelihood, you cannot even get your two meals in your shelter and clothing. So in this third chapter, Krishna very strongly advocates the principle of working for the pleasure of the Lord. I think in your country, you don't have a system of income tax, do you? No. Yeah, but, uh, but in many countries, but in other countries, non-socialist countries, they have the principle of income tax. So income tax means, suppose you're earning 1,000 rubles a month, you pay like 20% tax to the government. And if you do not pay this income tax, then you become liable for punishment. So Krishna makes a similar point in this third chapter of the Gita. He says, Yagnatat karmana nyata lokayam karma bandhana tadartam karma kantya mukta sangha samachara. He says that we must work for the pleasure of Vishnu. Otherwise, this work binds one to material existence. In other words, when you work for the pleasure of Vishnu, then you don't have to take on the reaction, the sinful reaction. And if you don't work for the pleasure of Vishnu, then you become liable for reaction or suffering. The Vedas explain, Yajnai Vai Vishnu. That means the goal of all sacrifices should be to please the Supreme Lord. So we have to learn, based on the direction of the spiritual master and the great sages, how we, should, we can act for the pleasure of Vishnu. So this is Krishna consciousness, to learn how to act for the pleasure of Vishnu. So looking at it from a practical viewpoint, Krishna consciousness is not a philosophy which says that if you're qualified, don't do your duty, but rather it means that you do your duty, but do it in relationship to the Supreme Lord. For example, as far as one's maintenance is concerned, there's no need to have very extravagant maintenance, but one can believe in the principle of simple living and high thinking. So if the principle is simple living and high thinking, then naturally you do not over endeavor to keep your two ends meet and you have time for spiritual activities. After all, the whole purpose of life is to understand our relationship with the Lord. This point is also made in the third chapter of the Gita. For example, in the very famous 10th verse of this chapter, Krishna says, Saha yajya praja shrishtva puro vacha prajapati 
अनेन प्रशा वेशियादावम एशो सोस्तव इशा काम अधोग दैट इस इन द वेरी बिगनिंग ऑफ क्रिएशन द लॉर्ड सेंड फोर्थ क्रिएटर्स एंड टोल देम बी दाउ हैप्पी बाय परफॉर्मिंग द सैक्रिफाइस फॉर द प्लेजर ऑफ लॉर्ड विष्णु इन अदर वर्ड्स जस्ट लाइक इन एनी सिविलाइज्ड कंट्री द गवर्नमेंट सेज इफ यू फॉलो आर लॉज then you can live freely so similarly the lord says that if you perform sacrifices for the pleasure of the lord then everything that you need will be automatically supplied similarly they're all being supplied by the supreme lord just like in many parts of the world we hear about food shortages so it does not matter how much of technology you may possess you cannot produce food unless the supreme lord cooperates through the agency of material nature you may have the best fertilizers on this planet but if mother earth, if the clouds don't give you rain water then the, nothing can happen isn't it and nobody has the technology to create artificial clouds to produce rain just like right now it's a rainy season in mosk so you see the clouds are all assembled over there and it rains So can, for example, December is not a rainy season, isn't it? The rainy season, December? No, no it's not a rain. So in December, can your Russian scientists say, okay, we'll produce rain in December? They cannot. So we must come to the realization that ultimately everything is coming from the Supreme Lord. So what Krishna is saying in this third chapter is that when you do your sacrifices for the pleasure of the Lord. Then whatever necessities of life you may have, they will all be provided. I'm sure all of you read in your pravada and its with your <coughs> papers about the starvation in so many different parts of the world, isn't it? So many. Hmm. So why uh, is there a shortage? Because essentially, material nature is unhappy with us. Just That's like true. when a child misbehaves, the parents get tough. They become angry, isn't it? So similarly, when we misbehave. the material nature says okay i'm not going to give you what you want so krishna says that if you do your duty towards the lord then even the devi gods will be pleased with your sacrifice and they will give you whatever you need one thing i've seen in your country <coughs> is that people have to stand in lines everywhere even this morning we were going to our book fair and there was such a long line to come to our pavilion number 1 at the book fair but actually nobody likes to stand in line Did just it. like sometimes you get caught in a traffic jam so you don't really like getting stuck in the traffic jam but do we realize how long a line we all had to stand in to get this human birth it was such a long line that if i told you how long you had to stand you would faint first you had to take your birth as species that live in water then you had to take your birth as species that live on land but cannot move like the trees and the plants and so on then you had to take your birth as, as entities that fly in the sky then as those who move around like insects i'm sure there are insects in your country also isn't it uh <laughs> it's not that all the insects are only in india and then you had to take your birth as species that live on land but move like the animals so after standing in line for such a long time for thousands of years finally you get this human birth just imagine if you had to stand in line for 2 or 3 hours to let's say get some milk or whatever and when your turn came at the window and the person closed the shop and said sorry no milk how do you feel <laughs> so you've stood in line for thousands of years now you've got this human birth and the purpose of this human birth is to establish a relationship with the lord and instead of establishing <clears throat> our relationship with the lord we are entangled in the same activities which even through the medium of animals we were able to realize so <clears throat> the point is and this point is very strongly stressed in this third chapter that we must perform yagya for the, for the pleasure <coughs> of the supreme lord now we see all over the world including your country there's so many rich people they may have one car two cars big house and so on they're getting all the necessities of life but they're not offering it to the lord so what is the position of these people very <clears throat> very often people say look at that man that man is uh, doing all this dirty business and he's living in such a big house and so on and here i am struggling and i have to live in such a poverty stricken condition krishna says 
those who take the benediction offered by the Lord and his agents and they do not offer it back to the Lord, they are simply thieves. So the point is that if we take the benedictions offered by the Lord, just like <coughs> being practical, I may be getting a lot of money, I may have a big house, I may have a nice car, family, etc. But if I'm not offering the results of what I'm getting to the Lord, then I'm simply a thief. So we can all safely conclude Basically, we're all members of a society of thieves. We're all members of a society of thieves because no one's offering anything to the Lord. When the American nation was formed, the founding fathers had made a more logo, in God we trust. But actually we see that they don't, they don't trust in God because if they trusted in God, then they would follow this chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. So the point is that we must learn in this human form of life to offer the results of our efforts to the Supreme Lord. Yesterday I was talking to somebody and one of you told me he was an economist. Are you an economist? So the real economic solution is given in the Bhagavad Gita. The real economic solution is given in the following verse. Anad bhavanti bhutani prajan anna sambhava yajya dvavati prajanyo yajya karma samud bhavaha. All living beings subsist on food grains, which are produced from rains. Rains are produced from performance of sacrifice, and sacrifice means prescribed duties. So the point is that the principle of sacrifice, which means performing religious duties, is what enables one to achieve economic stability and prosperity. Anyone will tell you that actually economic planning can only succeed if the natural resources are there by the agency of the Lord. If you don't have the natural resources, then whatever economic model you may prepare, there cannot be any success. And all natural resources are coming by the agency of the Lord. So Just like the Middle East countries have so much of oil now, but the oil was yes, not... Yes. Oil. oil, oil. But the oil was put over there by the Lord, not by the sheikhs. So the point is that we must understand that ultimately, if we offer everything to the Lord, then there'll be cooperation for material uh, nature and all the necessities of mankind will be realized. And that's uh, the goal of, okay. Another point that is made in this third chapter is, <laughs> is that, Veda Shastra ke Sambandha Abhidaya Prayojana. The whole purpose of Vedic knowledge is, to teach us how to regulate our life, to establish our relationship with the Lord. So Krishna says in this chapter that if one is leading a life and he's only working for sin's pleasure, then he's simply leading a life of sin. So therefore Krishna is saying, instead of having the path of sin's enjoyment, <coughs> one must lead a life of sacrifice. One should not be attached to the fruits of his activities. He should execute duty. Uh, he should execute his work as a matter of duty. Now, in terms of practical philosophy, this does not mean that in Krishna consciousness, we don't endeavor. The devotee tries his best for Krishna, not as he thinks, I'm doing my duty, but he does not be enthusiastic in doing his duty. Because without enthusiasm, you cannot succeed in any endeavor. Just like you may go on the streets to do book distribution, but if you're not enthusiastic in doing book distribution, nobody will buy your book. You cannot say, okay, I'm going to do my duty. I'll go out for book distribution. But you just go and stand on Goroki Street and say, you have to be enthusiastic in doing your duty. So the devotee, not that he doesn't try his best and he expects Krishna to work for him. A major difference between the perspective of a Vaishnava devotee and a so-called religionist is that the so-called religionist expects God to be his order supplier. People may go to the church or the temple, <coughs> but they go with the intention <coughs> that they're going to burden God with so many requests that they may have. But a Vaishnava devotee of the Lord, he does not want to burden the Lord with any material request. He wants to work for the Lord. In other words, just like, the mother doesn't expect anything from the young child, but just wants to serve the child. Similarly, the devotee Vaishnava, he wants to just serve the Lord, just like the mother serves the young child. So in the third chapter, Krishna also gives the example of King Janaka, who was the father-in-law of Lord Ramachandra, who even though he was completely detached, he still acted like an ideal king. 
to establish the example how one must do one's duty for the pleasure of the Lord. We see that even when Krishna appears on this planet, he does his duty. So we have to do our duty without being attached to the results. The devotees of the Lord have to set the example for the benefit of the others. Therefore, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Yad yad achrati shreshta tad eva janaha. Whatever great men do, others will follow. So, that is, whatever we do, if we are able to set an idle example of renunciation, then the members of the society will follow us. So, we have to develop a perfect character so that by our character, we can inspire others to take to the path of devotion. <clears throat> so, Krishna in the third chapter also says, how, even though he is not attached to anything, and he does not have to work. You and I have to work. Because if we don't work, we don't get our bread and butter. We have to work because we have so many needs, isn't it? We exactly. need money to pay your electric bill, house bill, food bill, your clothing, cosmetics and so on. We need all this because we are not complete. We are incomplete. But Krishna is complete. Om Purnam Adha Purnam Idam Purnat Purnam Udachate. He is complete in all respects. You and I get hungry after every four or five hours, but Krishna doesn't get hungry. So Krishna says, even though I don't need anything, even though I have everything, I still engage in performing my duty. Because if I did not do my duty, the whole world will be ruined. Can you imagine what would happen if one day the sun did not rise? Can you imagine what would happen if the sun rose one hour late? Can you imagine if the sun even moved by a fraction of an inch? What would happen? One side would get roasted and the other side would freeze. Can you imagine what would happen if it didn't rain all over this planet? If the clouds did not carry the water and release the water at the right time? Can you imagine what would happen if all the air was withdrawn from circulation? Spot. You would die. The whole world would be ruined, isn't it? So Krishna is doing his duty. He makes sure the wind is blowing. He makes sure that the clouds are carrying water and then releasing the water in the form of rain. So Krishna is making sure that if he did not do his duty, the whole world will be ruined. So he does his duty, as a, his work as a matter of duty. So Krishna is teaching Arjuna how to work without being attached to the results. Because those who are attached to their results are actually those who are under the influence of ignorance. Just like the those ignorant individuals who work very hard, they must work hard, they must get money. And they must use that money in exchange for buying sense enjoyment. Another point is in this third chapter, which is important to meditate, is that due to false ego, the living entity thinks that I am the doer. I am the doer. That means I, 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 my factory, my country, my effort. That is why the success is coming. But actually everything is being carried out by material nature. Just like in your country, there's so much of gold and gas and oil and so many other natural resources. So if anybody says that he is the cause, then it is simply an illusion. So one must understand that all this is happening by the arrangement of material nature. So what Krishna is very strongly advocating is that we must give up fruitive activities. So we had explained this point yesterday also, that fruitive activity means entering into some type of business transaction. That is, I'm ready to do this, but in exchange, I may get this, this, this benefit. So, Krishna is saying, give up fruit of activities and, O oh Arjuna, surrender all your works unto me with your knowledge full about me, with, without desire for profit, with no claims to proprietorship and free from false ego fight and laziness. So, this is the real purpose of the Bhagavad Gita and this introduction <coughs> is to all of us. Whether you're a student, um, a housewife, a businessman, a scientist, uh, or a simple brahmachari, whatever you may be, this is, this verse is instrumental for everyone. Krishna says with, with full knowledge of me. <coughs> that means we must have full knowledge about Krishna and his teachings. And with our desire for profit, we must work for the pleasure of Krishna. It's so we must Krishna. remember that if we work for Krishna, without being attached to the results, that means that we are not envious of Krishna and we become free from bondage. Um, so, we must dedicate our activities to the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. If we give up fruitive activities, 
and we work as it is necessary without being attached to the results, then we are on the path of perfection. And with our desire for profit, we must work for the pleasure of Krishna. So we must remember that if we work for Krishna without being attached to the results, that means that we are not envious of Krishna and we become free from bondage. Why is it that some people accept God's instruction and some do not? Some people, the majority of the people are envious of God. Because they're envious of God, they say, why shall I accept God? So those who are not envious of God, they accept the teachings of Krishna. And those who are envious of Krishna, they find fault in Krishna's teachings. And on some reason or the other, they reject the instructions of Krishna. Now, after listening to all this philosophy, Arjuna presented a very realistic question to Krishna. This is how we obtain spiritual knowledge. By asking questions. This is something remarkable I've seen about you Soviet devotees. You all ask a lot of questions. Prabhupada used to say that asking questions is a sign of intelligence. So Arjuna asked many questions also. So what is Arjuna's question now? He says, Krishna, even knowing what is right and what is wrong, how is one forced to engage in sinful activities? Like I'm sure many of you know, that, okay, this is bad. But sometimes, even though we know it's bad, even though we've heard it from the Guru, from Krishna, that this is bad, you still engage in it. So Arjuna wanted to know something that all of you may desire to know. How is one forced to engage in sinful acts, even unwillingly? Even without the desire, you may not desire to engage in sinful activities, still you get carried away and you engage in them. So the answer is, Kama esa krude esa raja gun samud bhavaha mahashano maha papma vidyenam iha vairinam. It is lust only which is born due to the material mode of passion and which is the eternal enemy of the living entity. So lust is the eternal enemy of the living entity. And the nature of this lust is it is always burning like fire and it is never satiated, never satisfied. Now, rain, water, when it is falling from the cloud, before it touches the earth, you know, it is pure. Just like when it's raining and you were to go on the roof and you had big buckets. And if your bucket was full of that water, then you could even drink that water. No problem. But I was coming into your building today and I saw downstairs, there were puddles of water. There was water because it rained and that mud, it had fallen on the mud and there's puddles of water downstairs also. Now, if somebody told you, take a glass of water from the puddle of water and drink, you will not drink. But that same water, before it touches the earth, if you would have caught it, you would have drunk it. Forget the rooftop. Even if you had a bucket, if you had a big, tall bucket, and you kept it on the ground downstairs, and if the water would have fallen directly on the bucket and not on the earth, you would drink it. So, similarly, the living entity's pure consciousness... The moment the living entity comes in contact with the material world, his, uh, his pure consciousness gets covered by his eternal enemy in the form of lust. And just like when the battle is being fought, everybody wants to know where, what is the position of the enemy, isn't it? One nation is spying on the other nation. They want to know where is the enemy station so they can throw the bomb on that. So similarly, for spiritual life, you may want to know where is the enemy in your body. So you can throw a spiritual bomb. So if you want to throw a spiritual bomb, throw it on the mind and the intelligence and the senses. Because this lust is sitting in the mind, the senses uh, and the intelligence. Like the senses that have lusty desires. The mind is thinking of lusty desires. And the intelligence is also thinking how lust can be fulfilled. What do people think with the intelligence? They're just thinking... How they can have more money, more sex, more sense enjoyment, more this, more that. Because that is the goal of life. Therefore, Krishna is telling us where our enemy is and how that enemy can be checked. So, we have positive uh, solution. The solution is we use the mind and the sense <coughs> and the intelligence in service to the Lord. Like with the intelligence, you should accept everything favorable for spiritual advancement and reject everything unfavorable for spiritual advancement. With your mind, you should always think how the wishes of the Lord can be fulfilled. 
and you use the senses always in service to the Lord. So if we use the senses in service to the Lord, then <coughs> the senses will have some positive engagement. Like those of you who have children or who have experience with children will testify that if you don't want your child to wreck your whole house, then you have to make the child sit in one corner and give him a paper and pencil so he keeps himself busy. Because if you cannot give your child something to keep himself busy, then he will just run around and create trouble. If you tell the child, okay, sit down, he won't sit down. So you tell the senses, okay, senses, sit down. The senses will say, sorry. You, if you don't give the senses positive engagement, they'll go in the negative engagement. Like the nature of the tongue is to always vibrate. Therefore, whenever you call somebody, the telephone is always engaged. Because everybody loves to talk. Because the tongue has to vibrate, use the tongue to glorify the Lord. The ears must listen to something. So hear about Krishna. The moment you get up in the morning, the eyes open and you want to see something. It's not you get up in the morning and walk around with your eyes closed. So if you don't see the form of the Lord or something about relationship to Krishna, then the eyes will say, okay, show me something vulgar. So Krishna says, lust is your enemy. And lust is sitting in the mind, the senses, and intelligence. Just like you go to the doctor, and the doctor tells you this is a disease. Now, take this as a medicine. The doctor tells you, don't do this, this, this. Because by doing this, the germs in the body will increase. So Krishna says, curb this enemy of spiritual life known as lust. Because this lust is destroying your spiritual life. So we must control the lust with intelligence. Great sages have said, that even though I've been trying to satisfy my senses in times of memorial, there's no satisfaction. Mind is higher than the senses. The senses are higher than dull matter. But what is higher than the mind? Intelligence. Intelligence. Intelligence is higher. So with the use of intelligence, we must control the mind, we must control the senses, and we must control dull matter. Matter cannot move on its own. Just like there is this glass over there here. This but, is a matter. This glass will only move when I lift it. So we can say the senses are superior to dull matter. And what makes my hand lift the glass? My mind. I lift the glass. Okay, keep it down. The so mind is superior to the senses. And what is directing the mind? The intelligence. So through the medium of intelligence, we must discipline the mind and the senses. Just like this very simple example that I gave you yesterday, which I will repeat. You may see a nice thing in the store and you may feel like buying it. But then your intelligence will say, if you buy it, you'll get arrested by the police. So then you don't buy it. You don't just steal it. Therefore, Krishna says, one must control the mind and the senses by spiritual intelligence. And by your spiritual strength, you must conquer this enemy known as lust. And how do you get spiritual strength? By chanting and hearing. By sadhu sangha. By listening, reading the Bhagavad Gita. So when you have spiritual strength, then lust can be defeated. Just like when you're very healthy, when your body is very healthy, then the germs that attack your body can be easily smashed, isn't it? But when the body is not healthy, then the germs are allowed to kill you. So when you become spiritually healthy, then lust will be controlled and you will be able to advance for Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Upa Krishna Maharaj Ki. So, what we have given you is a summary of the third chapter of the Gita. Okay, did you understand it? <coughs> Maybe after I finish giving all these summaries, I'll give you all a test. <laughs> See how good you all are. Okay, Va Pro Se. So, he's wondering. Uh, are there so many Vaishnavas who don't ask Krishna for material benefit in India? Those people who attend the temples, don't they ask Krishna for material things? They do. So they're not considered to be real Vaishnavas. Just because they're putting on the tila doesn't mean they become Vaishnavas. That's okay. Just like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu prayed to the Lord. Nadanam na janam na sundanam kavitamba jagadisha kamaye. Mama Janmani Janmeshwari Bhaktad Bhakti Raitu Kityai. My dear Lord, I don't want anything from you, but just the desire to take my birth again and again where I can serve you. Yes, we must pray to Krishna every day that please may all the obstacles on my spiritual advancement path go away so that I can serve you. This guy has uh, problems with health. Health. 
Hey. Yeah, that's good. So he's asking, uh, asks Krishna in his prayers to, um, take, to solve the problems and Krishna doesn't solve them. So that reduces his, his, um, faith. What should he do? You must understand whatever suffering that we are due, whatever suffering that we are experiencing has been greatly minimized by the Lord. Actually, Krishna is testing you how sincere your faith is in Him. It is not that now you're a devotee of Krishna, you will have to face no obstacles at all. Krishna will test his devotee by putting him into difficulties. Rather, you must understand it from this angle. According to my past sinful karma, I should have been suffering from cancer or something and should have been in hospital. But due to your call this mercy, Krishna, you have minimized my suffering and I'm still, and I'm still here chanting your name. Don't think that you're chanting Hare Krishna. Now Krishna has to wipe away all your karma from previous lives. Krishna will reduce your sinful reaction but not bring it to zero. <laughs> if Krishna brings a sinful reaction to zero, then where is the suffering? Where is the dukhalayam and the shashatam? So you will say, well, now I'm chanting Hare Krishna. Why am I becoming old? Why am I getting <laughs> old? Why? why? If I'm chanting Hare Krishna, why do I ever fall sick? And certainly, if I'm chanting Hare Krishna, I should live till 120. Why at 80 should I yes, die? Yes. And if I'm chanting Hare Krishna, I must have a Mercedes car at least. For it to be clean, or uh, she should always think that she's cleaning the Krishna's kitchen. She's cleaning Krishna's kitchen. Because whatever you do, you should think you're doing it for Krishna. You can't have Krishna's kitchen dirty. Prabhupada said, the cook who cook, cooks, after cooking, he must clean. It's asking that sometimes it happens that a person, he wants to drink milk, then he goes to the altar, puts milk, offers, then after some time he wants to take an apple, so he just takes <laughs> apple, goes to the altar, he offers to Krishna. So uh, is that um, okay, But or should a person just do a big offering in the morning, like make all the... Kind of so if you cannot make one big offering, then you can make this. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It, it, it is. It is best. It is best to have regulated hours of eating. If you're going to eat all day, then you're going to be become overweight. Therefore, I said you should eat, plan your eating. Bhagavad Gita says one must be very regulated in eating and sleeping. I'm just going to take two or three more questions. The question. Okay, uh, I understand. What is the criteria of surrendering? The, the criteria of surrender is you don't want to do anything which does not have the approval of the spiritual master and the Lord. So uh, the symptom of surrender is you don't want to do anything that is not approved by Krishna. Uh, an attentive, the question is about an attentive chanting. When a person, especially a newcomer, is chanting attentively, uh, doesn't it, some, some, some people say that, doesn't it just useless chanting? Well, whether 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 you're new or old, your chanting will be very attentive. Inattentive, inattentive chanting will not be very helpful in the goal of life. So we'll talk about this on Sunday. Yeah. So we must be very attentive in our chanting. Yeah. The more attention you pay to the holy name, the more attention Krishna will pay to you. Seek the sixth quality of the devotees um, to have a strong faith that Krishna will protect you and. Um, and the also a criteria that Krishna, uh, that the devotee shouldn't chant for the, uh, something to get any benefit from Krishna. Can we chant the holy names, uh, thinking that Krishna will help us in, for, 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 to get protection, <coughs> Krishna's protection? Yes, Krishna will help us to make spiritual advancement if you're chanting sincerely. <coughs> but don't think that because you're chanting the holy name, now you must get a Lada car and a big house and a promotion every month. But Krishna will definitely protect you against the agents of Maya if you're chanting sincerely. He Not guarantees that. There's one woman in Arbat Street who just mm -hmm. always comes when devotees have Harinam and she propagates Christianity. But in the same time she chastises Krishna consciousness. What uh, attitude should we have against it? Kind of people. At least that lady is always hearing the chanting of Hare Nam. So even though she may be preaching Christianity, but she's in love with Hare Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> so you should tell her, you're most welcome to hear her head chanting, but the chanting is so purifying, it will purify everyone. So you should be kind and respectful to her, and she will join you very soon. Because by your <laughs> chanting, she begins to talk about Christ. 
And when you don't go chanting, she's sleeping at home. So it is good. <laughs> and there's a di different, sometimes devotees are very respectful to um, Mahaprasad, which is on the altar. But uh, at the same time, they can, uh, the, that which is on the pot, they don't take so seriously. They can scratch something, or this is burned, throw away. <laughs> no, actually, we should be respectful to Prashadam. Just because Mahaprasadam and Prashadam both have to be respected. Certainly, if you have if you have a cooking pot, then you should not uh, scrape it with your dirty spoon. In fact, in this third chapter, Krishna says, if you don't offer your food stuff to me, then you're eating only sin. And if something is offered to Krishna, then you have to follow the Vedic process. This is your propensity, but uh, when devotee he lives Krishna consciousness, then uh, he falls even in the lower position. Um, comparing to that which he had before coming to the movement. But uh, Niranjan Maharaj, who gave lectures also, he said that uh, when devotee goes, uh, leaves Krishna consciousness, we still should not uh, um, see him as a karmi, and we still have uh, should have some respect to that person, even, yes. even if he stops chanting. We something. should have some respect. Something wrong. We should have some respect for that person, and we should pray that that person may be brought back to Krishna. And you should wish that that accident may not happen to you. Just like if you see somebody involved in an accident on the road, you don't wish that you should also have that accident. Okay, so um, should we stop over here? Did you all understand the sure. chapter? So who, what is the key point? What does have some of the points that Krishna stresses in the third chapter? What is the third chapter called? What is it called? So what is Krishna saying in the third chapter? So... Put your hands up and I'll ask you questions. Mouth shut and hands up. Uh, not getting attached to the, um, to the uh, results. What does Krishna say about duty? Does Krishna say, just Jan Hare Krishna and leave everything unto me? What does it mean to work in Krishna consciousness? Which mean, that means to work and offer the results to Krishna. What does Krishna say about controlling the senses? When Arjuna wanted to know, how is one forced to engage in sinful activities? What did Krishna say? Lust. What is superior to dull matter? Well, you answered everything. I just wanted to go. What, what is superior to... Okay. What is superior to dull matter? <laughs> <laughs> what is superior... Alexei, what is superior to dull matter? Uh, sense. What is superior to the senses? Mind. What is superior to the mind? What is superior to intelligence? So, uh, what is the economic solution that the Bhagavad Gita gives? Economist. What is the economic solution that the Bhagavad Gita gives? <laughs> what does Krishna say? How is how is how are food grains to be realized? How is the grain production takes place? How how? Yes. Everything is supplied by the Supreme Lord. Uh -huh. yeah. So Krishna says in the third chapter that we must do our duty. So suppose you have to do your book distribution. Hmm. You just go on the street and just stand straight like a <laughs> mummy, like a <laughs> with a book in your hand, or what do you have to do? Effort, effort, enthusiasm, enthusiasm. Yeah. So, in the third chapter, Krishna is telling Arjuna that he must do his duty. Yes. What does Krishna say to give an example? Krishna is telling Arjuna, do your duty, okay? Yes. Now, without being attached to the results. It's Krishna saying that he is offering himself. And what example does he give? Yes. And one more example. What else? No, there's one other That's example a, Krishna gives. Opinion. It's a name of a man who starts with J. Oh. He's a struggler. <laughs> <laughs> you know the answer? Janaka. King Janaka. Krishna says in the past when people like King Janaka acted with this understanding. Today we discussed the third chapter. Yesterday we discussed the second chapter. Huh? Are you all getting an understanding? So tomorrow we'll discuss the fourth chapter. Now, on Sun tomorrow the program is at 3.30 in Premavati's house. And on Sunday, there are two programs. In the morning, 11 o'clock. In the morning on Sunday, sharp 11 o'clock, Nicholas house. And evening, 4.30 in Krishna Kumar's house. 4.35. The morning program will just be from 11 to 2.
and the evening program will be from 5 to so I'll do fourth chapter tomorrow evening, fifth chapter in the morning on Sunday, sixth chapter in the evening on Sunday. So everyone is clear? They know Nicholas's house? Gopal Krishna Maharaj. Thank you.